Chapter 1 Mystery The scapel that split consciousness On the courts How it is that anything so remarkable as a state of consciousness comes about as a result of irritating nervous tissue is just as unaccountable as the appearance of the jinn when Aladdin robbed his lamp Closed courts Thomas Huxley from The Elements of Physiology and Hygiene A motion became a feeling No phrase that our lips can frame is so devoid of apprehensible meaning. William James, The Principles of Psychology. In February of 1962, Joseph Bogan and Philip Vogel sliced in half the brain of Bill Jenkins intentionally, methodically, and with careful premeditation. Jenkins then in his late 40s recovered and went on to enjoy a quality of life that had eluded him for years. In the decade that followed, Bogan and Vogel split brain after brain in California, earning them the epithet "the West Coast Butchers." Under quotes, is brain that they split belong to a person who suffered from severe and intractable epilepsy, a condition caused by abnormal neural activity racing through the brain. The best drugs available at the time failed these epileptics, leaving them vulnerable to a seizure, a convulsion, or a drop attack. Under quotes. a sudden loss of muscle tone that often caused a damaging fall normal life evaded them they couldn't drive work or enjoy a carefree night at a ball game daily existence devolved into drudgery punctuated by episodes of horror bogan and vogel were talented neurosurgeons based at the university of southern california and the california institute of technology They split the brains of epileptics in a daring attempt to quarantine the anomalous neural activity that ravages their lives. The surgery was delicate and intricate, but its idea was simple. The human brain harbors 86 billion neurons that converse in an electrochemical dialect, a vast social network, each member following and being followed as if they were tweeting and retweeting each in its own unique style. Each neuron tweets via its axon and follows via its dendrites. This network despite its complexity is normally stable allowing an orderly flow of messages but as a collision of cars can disrupt in widening ripples the flow of traffic in a city so also a sudden surfeit of aberrant signals in the brain can disrupt the flow of electrochemical messages through the brain triggering seizures convulsions and the loss of consciousness Bogan and Vogel sought to halt the disastrous ripples before they swamped the brain Fortunately the anatomy of the brain itself suggests an opportune place and method the brain is divided into two hemispheres left and right each hemisphere has 43 billion neurons their axons subdivide like branches of a tree to allow trillions of links among them but in contrast to the rich interconnections within a hemisphere the bond between hemispheres is a tiny cable the corpus callosum with just over 200 million axons roughly one axon between the hemispheres for every 200 within a hemisphere this bottleneck offers a ideal place to cut and thereby to halt the spread of the debilitating ripples from one hemisphere to the other this scheme is admittedly crude much like trying to stop the spread of a computer virus from europe to the americas by cutting all cables across the atlantic But trials was necessary. Bogan and Vogel chose to let one hemisphere endure the fury of epilepsy in hopes that the other hemisphere and thus the patient might suffer less. The surgery known technically as corpus callosotomy and informally as a split brain operation under quotes was a clinical success. Bill Jenkins suffered no more drop attacks and and just two general convulsions in the next 10 years. Other patients enjoyed similar relief. One attended a ball game in person for the first time in years and another landed a full-time job for the first time in his life. Callosotomy was soon regarded not as west coast butchery but as a possible new treatment modality under quotes. When I first met Bogan in 1995 Our topic of discussion was not the dramatic success of his surgery but the exotic changes in consciousness that it triggers. Joe had been invited to speak at a meeting of the Hemholtz Club, a small group of neuroscientists, cognitive scientists and philosophers that for many years met monthly at UC Irvine. The purpose of the club was to explore how advances in neuroscience might spawn a scientific theory of consciousness. We met in Irvine because its central location was convenient for members as far north as Caltech, USC and UCLA and as far south as UC San Diego and the Salk Institute. 
We met in secret to avoid interlopers attracted by the fame of one club member, Francis Crick, who had focused his powerful intellect on the mystery of consciousness. We started our meetings with a buffet lunch at the university club at UC Irvine, then spent the afternoon in a private room, grilling two invited speakers until 6 o'clock. We then retired to a restaurant, usually near South Coast Plaza, and continued deliberating late into the night. The mystery of consciousness, which was the focus of the Helmholtz Club and the subject of Bogen's talk, is quite simply the mystery of who we are. Your body, like other objects, has physical attributes such as position, mass, and velocity. If, heaven forbid, a rock and your body fell simultaneously from the Leaning Tower of Pisa, both would strike the ground at the same time. On the other hand, we differ from rocks in two key respects. First, we experience sensations. We taste chocolate, suffer headaches, smell garlic, hear trumpets, see tomatoes, feel dizzy, and enjoy orgasms. If rocks have orgasms, they are not letting on. Second, we have propositional attitudes, under quotes, such as the belief that rocks don't have headaches, the fear that stocks might fall, the wish to vacation in Tahiti, and the wonder why Chris won't call. Such attitudes allow us to predict and interpret our behavior and that of others. If you wish to vacation in Tahiti and believe that you'll need an airline ticket to do so, then there's a good chance you'll buy that ticket. Your propositional attitudes predict and explain your behavior. If Chris calls and says he'll arrive on the train tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, then your attribution of propositional attitudes to Chris, that he wants and intends to take the train, allows you to predict where he will be tomorrow at 9 indeed with greater facility than if you knew the state of each particle of his body. Like a rock, we have bona fide physical properties, but unlike a rock, we have conscious experiences and propositional attitudes. Are these also physical? If so, it's not obvious. What is the mass of dizziness, the velocity of a headache, or the position of the wonder why Chris won't call? In each case, the question itself seems to harbor confusion and to mismatch categories. Dizziness is not the kind of thing that can be weighed on a scale. A wonder has no spatial coordinates. A headache can't be clocked with a radar gun. But conscious experiences and propositional attitudes are essential to human nature. Delete them and we lose our very selves. The bodies that remained would lumber through life pointlessly. So, what kind of creature are you? How is your body related to your conscious experiences and propositional attitudes? How is your experience of child art related to activities in your brain? Are you just a biochemical machine? If so, how does your brain give rise to your conscious experiences? The question is deeply personal and, as it happens, deeply mysterious. The German mathematician and philosopher Gottfried Leibniz grasped the mystery in 1714, under quotes, It must be confessed, however, that perception and that which depends upon it are inexplicable by mechanical causes, that is to say, by figures and motions. Supposing that there were a machine whose structure produced thought, sensation, and perception, we could conceive of it as increased in size with the same proportions until one was able to enter into its interior, as he would into a mill. Now on going into it, he would find only pieces working upon one another, but never would he find anything to explain perception. Closed quotes. Leibniz invented a variety of machines, including clocks, lamps, pumps, propellers, submarines, and hydraulic presses, he built a mechanical calculator, the stepped reckoner, under quotes, which could add, subtract, multiply, divide numbers with results up to 16 digits. He believed that human reasoning could, in principle, be modeled by computational machines. But he saw no way for a machine to generate perceptual experiences. The English biologist Thomas Huxley was flummoxed by this mystery in 1869. Under quotes, how is that anything so remarkable as a state of consciousness comes about as a result of irritating nervous tissue is just as unaccountable as the appearance of the zin when Aladdin robbed his lamp. Closed quotes. Huxley was an expert at anatomy and neuroanatomy. He compared the brains of humans and other primates, showing that the similarity of their structures supported Darwin's theory of human evolution. But he found nothing in the brain that could explain how it might generate conscious experiences. The American psychologist William James grappled with the mystery of consciousness in 1890, exclaiming that, under quotes, a motion became a feeling. No phrase that our lips can frame is so devoid of apprehensible meaning. Closed quotes. He agreed with the Irish physicist John Tyndall that, under quotes, the passage from the physics of the brain to the corresponding facts of consciousness is unthinkable.
closed quotes. Freud was confounded by the mystery. Under quotes, we know two things concerning what we call our psyche, our mental life. Firstly, its bodily organ. And secondly, our acts of consciousness. So far as we are aware, there is no direct relation between them. Closed quotes. James and Freud offered deep insights into human psychology and understood that psychology and neurobiology are correlated. But they had no theory of how brain activity might cause conscious experiences. No idea how to dispel the mystery. Consciousness is still one of the great mysteries of science. A special 2005 issue of the journal Science ranked the top 125 open questions in science. The first place winner was, what is the universe made of? A well-deserved win, given that today 96% of the matter and energy in the universe is dark, under quotes, meaning we're in the dark about it, under quotes. The runner-up was, what is the biological basis of consciousness? That is the question that the Helmholtz Club pursued. It is the mystery that researchers around the world still struggle to solve. Note how science states the question, what is the biological basis of consciousness? It reveals the kind of answer that most researchers expect, that there is a biological basis of consciousness, that consciousness is somehow caused by or arises from or is identical to certain kinds of biological processes. Given this assumption, the goal is to find the biological basis and describe how consciousness arises from it. That there is a neural origin for consciousness was the working hypothesis of Francis Crick. As he put it, under quotes, the astonishing hypothesis is that you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. You are nothing but a pack of neurons. Closed quotes. This was the working hypothesis of the Helmholtz Club and the reason that many of our invited speakers were, like Joe Bogan, experts in neuroscience. We sought clues that would lead us to the critical nerve cells and molecules that would crack the mystery of consciousness. Like paleontologists at a dig, we scoured the research of our speakers, hoping to unearth insights that could explain why some physical systems are conscious and others are not. Our hope was not unfounded. For centuries, biologists sought a mechanism that would explain why some physical systems are alive and others are not. But vitalists, who hold that living organisms differ fundamentally from non-living things, claim that this quest would fail because, they argued, you cannot cook up life from the inanimate ingredients of the physical world. A special non-physical ingredient, an elan vital, is also required. Debate between vitalists and biologists persisted until the celebrated discovery in 1953 by James Watson and Francis Crick of the double helix of DNA, which proved the vitalists wrong. This structure, with its four-letter code and penchant for replication, brilliantly solved the problem of cooking of life mechanistically from purely physical ingredients. It allowed the young field of molecular biology to wed naturally with Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection granting us tools to understand the evolution of life, to decipher its checkered odyssey over billions of years, and to create technologies that let us redesign life much as we please. The triumph of mechanistic physicalism over vitalism was decisive. Inspired by this triumph, the Helmholtz Club expected that, in due course, consciousness would acquiesce to a mechanistic explanation caused in the language of neuroscience, opening new vistas for scientific exploration and technological innovation. In 1993, over lunch at the club, Crick told me he was writing a book, The Astonishing Hypothesis on Neuroscience and Consciousness. Can you explain, I asked, how neural activity causes conscious experiences, such as my experience of the color red? No, he said, if you could make up any biological fact you want. I persisted, can you think of one that would let you solve this problem? No, he replied but added that we must pursue research in neuroscience until some discovery reveals the solution. Krieg was right. Absent a mathematical proof to the contrary, and given the impressive precedent of DNA, it is sensible to source for a double helix of neuroscience, a key fact whose discovery unravels the mystery of consciousness. It might be that our conscious wave of dreams, aspirations, fears, sense of self, and the sense of free will is spawned by packs of neurons via a remarkable mechanism that we don't foresee. Our failure to envision a mechanism does not preclude one. Perhaps we are not clever enough, and an experiment will teach us what we can't surmise from an armchair. After all, we invest in experiments because they often repay us in surprise. 
Consider, for instance, experiments on split brain patients conducted by the neurobiologist Roger Sperry. They reveal several surprises about human consciousness. In one experiment, a person stares at a small cross in the center of a screen. Then two words such as key ring flash on the screen for a tenth of a second with key to the left of the cross and ring to the right like this key plus ring. If you ask normal observers to report what they saw, they all say key ring. The task is easy. A tenth of a second is plenty of time to read the words. But if you ask split brain patients, they say ring. If you ask what kind of ring, a wedding ring, a doorbell ring, a key ring, they stick with ring. They cannot say what kind of ring. You then blindfold a split brain patient and bring out a box full of items, a ring, a key, a pencil, a spoon, a key ring, and so on. You ask the patient to reach in with their left hand and pick out the item that was named on the screen. Their left hand searches in the box, picking up and putting down items until it finds what it wants. When the left hand finally exits the box, it always holds a key. During its search, the left hand may encounter and reject a key ring. After the left hand exits the box, you may ask the blindfolded patient, what's in your left hand? They say they don't know. Can you guess? They guess small items that could fit in a box, such as a pencil or a spoon, but they don't accept by accident guess correctly. You then ask the blindfolded patients to reach into the box with their right hand and retrieve the item that was named on the screen. Their right hand pulls out a ring. During its search, the right hand may encounter and reject a key ring. If you ask the blindfolded patient, what's in your right hand, they correctly and confidently say, ring. Now, while the patient still holds an item in its hand, you remove the blindfold, let them see both hands and ask, you said you saw the word ring, so why does your left hand hold a key? The patient either has no idea or else confabulates, concocting a false story intended to be plausible. You then ask them, would you please draw with your left hand what you saw? They draw a key. Explaining experiments like these earned Rosa Sperry a share of the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 1981. Sperry's explanation was simple and profound. When you fix it on the cross in key ring, the neural pathways from eye to brain send key only to the right hemisphere and ring only to the left. If the corpus callosum is intact, the right hemisphere then tells the left about the key and the left tells the right about the ring, so the person sees key ring. If the callosum is caught, then the hemispheres no longer liaise. The right hemisphere sees key and the left sees ring. And neither sees key ring. The left can speak and the right cannot, apart from its talent to swear, which can become painfully apparent when a stroke in the left hemisphere leaves a person unable to speak but well able to turn the air blue. Thus, if the split brain patient is asked, what did you see? The left hemisphere replies, ring. The left hemisphere feels and controls the right hand. If the patient is asked, please pick out with your right hand what you saw, then the left hemisphere guiding the right hand picks what it saw, a ring. The right hemisphere feels and controls the left hand. If the patient is asked, please pick out with your left hand what you saw, then the right hemisphere guiding the left hand picks what it saw, a key. When asked what's in your left hand, the patient cannot say, because only the right hemisphere knows and only the left hemisphere speaks. The astonishing hypothesis, under quotes, offers a cogent explanation. If consciousness arises from the interactions of a pack of neurons, then splitting that pack and their interactions can split consciousness. To the untutored intuition, it seems unlikely that consciousness can be split with a scalpel. What could it mean to split my feelings, my knowledge, my emotions, my beliefs, my personality, my very self? Most of us would dismiss the idea as ludicrous, but Sperry, after years of careful experiments, the evidence was clear. Under quotes, actually the evidence as we see it favors the view that the minor hemisphere is very conscious indeed, and further that both the separated left and the right hemispheres may be conscious simultaneously in different and even conflicting mental experiences that run along in parallel. Close quotes. The evidence for this conclusion has continued to mount. In one patient, the carrier goals of the two hemispheres differed. The left hemisphere said it wanted to be a draftsman. 
in the right hemisphere using the left hand to assemble scribal letters wrote that it wished to automobile race. In another, the left hemisphere used the right hand to button a shirt, while the right hemisphere used the left hand to promptly unbutton it. The right hand lit a cigarette and the left put it out. Two persons with distinct likes and dislikes appear to reside and sometimes quarrel side by side inside one skull. Their differences can transcend the personal to the theological. In one patient studied by neuroscientist V. S. Ramachandran, the pious left hemisphere believes in God, but the impious right does not. When the bell tolls and both hemispheres approach the pearly gates, will St. Peter need an assist from King Solomon? Or was the grim solution of Solomon already applied by the scapel of Bogen? Tough questions for a future neurotheology. What kind of creatures are we that our beliefs, desires, personalities, and perhaps the destinies of our souls can be split with a scapel? Why are we conscious? What is consciousness? Can neuroscience decipher the perennial mystery of human consciousness? The source light of science which has revealed insights into the realm of the impersonal black holes, bound quarks, slow tectonic plates, is now being directed toward what matters to us most our deeply personal world of conscious beliefs, desires, emotions, and sensory experiences. Might we glimpse and even comprehend our very selves? This is an aspiration of the science of consciousness. Reaching this goal will require clever experiments and a soup con of serendipity. Many experiments hunt for correlations between neural activity and consciousness, expecting that as the hunt succeeds, as the list of correlations grows, a critical discovery will solve the mystery of consciousness, just as the double helix solved the mystery of life. We know that specific activities of the brain correlate with specific conscious and unconscious mental states. As we have discussed, activity of the entire left hemisphere, if surgically disconnected from the right, correlates with a repertoire of conscious states that is distinct from that of the right. But at final levels of neural organization, we find a plethora of intriguing correlations. For instance, activity in area V4 of temporal lobe correlates with the conscious experiences of color. A stroke in V4 of left hemisphere leads the patient to lose color in the right half of the visual world, a condition known as hemiachromatopsia. If the patient stares, say, at the middle of a red apple, then the left half of the apple looks red and the right half looks grey. If instead a stroke damages area B4 in the right hemisphere, then the right half of the apple looks red and the left half looks grey. A normal person can enter briefly into the color world of the hemiachromatopsic via transcranial magnetic stimulation TMS. TMS is induced by a strong magnet placed near the skull whose magnetic field is said either to enhance or impair activity in regions of the brain nearby. If TMS impairs activity of V4 in the left hemisphere, then as the person watches, color drains from the right half of the world. If they look directly at the red apple, the right half of the apple fades to grey. Turn off the TMS and the red color shifts back into the right half of the apple. If TMS stimulates V4, then the person will hallucinate chromatophenes, colored rings and halos. With TMS, you can pour colors into consciousness or siphon them out of consciousness. Activity in a region of the brain called post-central gyrus correlates with conscious experiences of touch. The neurosurgeon Wilder Penfield reported in 1937 that stimulating this gyrus with an electrode in the left hemisphere prompted his patients to report conscious experiences of touch on the right side of the body. Stimulating the right hemisphere led to feelings of touch on the left side of the body. The correlation is systematic. Nearby points on the gyrus correspond to nearby points on the body. And regions of the body that are more sensitive, such as lips and fingertips, occupy more real estate on the gyrus. Stimulate the gyrus near the middle of the brain and you feel it in your toes. Slide the electrode along the gyrus, stimulating at ever more lateral points. And the feeling, with a few exceptions, slides systematically up the body. The exceptions are interesting. The face, for instance, resides next to the hand of the gyrus. The toes are next to the genitals, a fact perhaps relevant to foot fetishes, as V. S. Ramachandran has suggested. Many experiments today continue the hunt for neural correlates of consciousness, under quotes, or NCCs. This hunt is aided by a variety of technologies for measuring neural activity. For instance, functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, tracks neural activity by measuring the flow of blood in the brain. 
Neural activity, like muscle activity, requires greater flow of blood to supply the extra energy and oxygen that are required. Electroencephalography, or EEG, using electrodes glued to the scalp, tracks neural activity by measuring tiny fluctuations of voltage that it generates. Magnetoencephalography, or MEG, tracks neural activity by measuring tiny fluctuations of magnetic fields. Microelectrodes can record the individual signals, called spikes or action potentials, or single neurons and small groups of neurons. Optogenetics uses colored lights to control and monitor the activity of neurons that have been genetically engineered to respond to specific colors. The strategy of hunting for NCCs makes sense. If you want a theory that links neurons and consciousness and we have no plausible ideas, then we can start by looking for correlations between them. Inspecting these correlations, we might discover a pattern that turns a conceptual light bulb. The path from correlation to causation, to be sure, is fraught with pitfalls. If a crowd forms at a train platform, then often a train soon arrives. But crowds don't impel trains to roll in. Something else, a train schedule, creates the correlation between the crowds and the trains. NCCs are key data for a theory of consciousness. Such a theory must perform two tasks. It must delineate the boundary between the conscious and the unconscious, and it must explain the provenance and the rich variety of our experiences, the taste of a lemon, the fear of spiders, the joy of discovery. For the simpler, though not simple, task of demarcating the conscious and unconscious, we want to know how brain activity differs in the two cases. Here we have interesting data. For instance, in normal consciousness, neural activity is neither random nor too stable, but it strikes a critical balance between the two, like a seasoned hiker that neither flits about nor loafs in one place, but intelligently explores the terrain. Propofol, which can induce general anesthesia, makes neural activity ploddingly stable. For the complex case of specific experiences of tasting chocolate or fearing spiders, we want to find tight correlations between neural activity and each experience. But what is tight? That's not easy to nail down. Many researchers assume that it's the minimal neural activity that, under the right conditions, is sufficient to make the experience happen. They source for this minimal activity by contrastive analysis, under quotes, comparing how neural activity changes when an experience changes. For instance, if you view the Necker cube shown in the figure one, you can have two different experiences. In one phase, phase A is in the front, in the other, phase B. As you view the middle cube, you probably flip between the two experiences. A change in your neural activity that tracks your flip between experiences could be an NCC for your experience of the cube. The neat trick in this experiment is that your experience flips, but the image doesn't. This makes it easier to ascribe your flip in conscious experience to the change in neural activity. But this activity still might not be the NCC. Some of the activity could be a precursor to the NCC or a consequence of the NCC rather than the NCC itself. Careful experiments are required to tease these possibilities apart. Figure one, the Necker cube. When we view the cube in the middle, we sometimes see the face A in front, but at other times we see face B in front. NCCs are important for theory and also for practice. Arachnophobia, an excessive fear of spiders, is correlated with the activity in the amygdala. Triggering this fear and its NCC in the amygdala allows both to be erased. Meryl Kind, a psychotherapist in the Netherlands, cures arachnophobia by asking the arachnophobe first to touch a live tarantula, thus activating the phobia and its NCC. She then asks the patient to take a 40 mg pill of propanol, a beta adrenergic blocker that disrupts the NCC from being stored back into memory. When the patient returns the next day, the fovea is gone. The therapy holds promise for other foveas and for post-traumatic stress disorder. Another example explores optogenetics, a biological technique that uses light to control neurons that have been genetically altered. With optogenetics, it's possible to turn on an NCC for a positive feeling at the flip of a switch and then just as quickly turn it off. Christine Denny at Columbia University has pulled off this remarkable feat using mice genetically engineered with a gene from algae that codes for a light-sensitive protein. In nature, the algae use this protein to respond intelligently to light. In the engineered mouse, the gene hides silently, 
unexpressed until the drug tamoxifen is injected. Then, for a brief time, any neurons that happen to become electrically excited will activate the gene and insert the protein into their membranes. Denny places an injected mouse into an environment it likes, soft, dim, with places to take cover. The mouse happily explores this idyllic environment and any neurons engaged in creating a happy NCC insert the protein into their membranes. Then later, Denny can trigger its happy NCC using fiber optics that flash into its brain a color light that activates the protein. Even if the mouse sits in a frightful place, hard, bright, no way to take cover, it feels a halcyon space until the fiber optics are turned off. Then it freezes in fear, turn the light back on, and once again it happily grooms and explores. These are impressive applications of NCCs. Equally impressive is our utter failure to understand the relation between NCCs and consciousness. We have no scientific theories that explain how brain activity or computer activity or any other kind of physical activity could cause or be or somehow give rise to conscious experience. We don't have even one idea that's remotely plausible. If we consider not just brain activity but also the complex interactions among brains, bodies and the environment, we still strike out, we're stuck. Our utter failure leads some to call this the hard problem under quotes, of consciousness, or simply a mystery. We know far more neuroscience than Huxley did in 1869, yet each scientific theory that tries to conjure consciousness from the complexity of interactions among brain, body and environment always invokes a miracle at precisely that critical point where experience blossoms from complexity. The theories are Rube Goldberg devices that lack a critical domino and need a sneak push to complete the trick. What do we want in a scientific theory of consciousness? Consider the case of testing basil versus hearing a siren. For a theory that proposes that brain activity causes conscious experiences, we want mathematical laws or principles that state precisely which brain activities cause the conscious experience of testing basil, precisely why this activity does not cause the experience of, say, hearing a siren, and precisely how this activity must change to transform the experience from testing basil to, say, testing rosemary. These laws or principles must apply across species, or else explain precisely why different species require different laws. No such laws, indeed no plausible ideas, have ever been proposed. If we propose that brain activity is identical to, or gives rise to conscious experiences, then we want the same kind of precise laws or principles that link each specific conscious experience, such as the taste of basil, with the specific brain activities that give rise to it with the specific brain activities that it is identical to or with the specific brain activities that give rise to it. No such laws or principles have ever been offered. If we propose that conscious experience is identical, say, to certain processes of the brain that monitor other processes, then we need to write down laws and principles that precisely specify these processes and the conscious experiences with which they are identical. If we propose that conscious experience is an illusion arising from some brain processes attending to, monitoring and describing other brain processes, then we must state laws or principles that precisely specify these processes and the illusions they generate. And if we propose that conscious experiences emerge from brain processes, then we must give the laws or principles that describe precisely when and how its specific experience emerges. Until then, these ideas aren't even wrong. Hand waves about identity, emergence or attentional processes that describe other brain processes are no substitute for precise laws or principles that make quantitative predictions. We have scientific laws that predict black holes, the dynamics of quarks and the evolution of the universe, yet we have no clue how to formulate laws, principles or mechanisms that predict our quotidian experiences of tasting herbs and hearing street noise. Perhaps Creek was right. Maybe we just haven't found the crucial experiment that unveils the breakthrough idea. Perhaps one day, funding permitting, we will. The double helix of neuroscience will be discovered and a genuine theory of consciousness will follow. Or perhaps we were shortchanged by evolution and lack the concepts needed to understand the relationship between brains and consciousness. Cats can't do calculus and monkeys can't do quantum theory. So why assume that homo sapiens can demystify consciousness? Perhaps we don't need more data. Perhaps what we need is a mutation that lets us understand the data we have. Noam Chomsky dismisses arguments from evolution about limits to our cognitive capacities. 
but he insists nonetheless that we must recognize the scope and limits of human understanding under quotes and some differently structured intelligence might reward human mysteries as simple problems and wonder that we cannot find the answers much as we can observe the inability of rats to run prime number mazes because of the very design of their cognitive nature closed quotes i suspect chomsky is right there are limits to a human understanding and i admit that these limits whether they derive from evolution or another source may preclude us from understanding the relation between consciousness and neural activity but before punting that the hard problem of consciousness we might consider a different possibility perhaps we possess the necessary intelligence and are hindered by a false belief false beliefs rather than innate limits can stomp our efforts to solve puzzles examples of this are standard fare in textbooks on cognitive science in one example people are given a candle a box of thumb tracks and a book of matches they are asked to fasten the candle to a wall so that uh, when lit its wax can drip on the floor most people fail they tacitly assume that the box must do one thing hold thumb tacks they don't think to dump the tacks out of the box to use the tacks to fasten the box to the wall and to put the candle in the box to solve the puzzle they must challenge a false assumption what false assumption be devils are efforts to unravel the relation between brain and consciousness i propose it is this we see reality as it is of course no one believes that we see all of reality as it is physicists tell us that for instance that the light we see is a tiny fraction of an immense electromagnetic spectrum that we can't see including ultraviolet infrared radio waves microwaves x-rays and cosmic rays some animals perceive what we cannot birds and bees see ultraviolet peat vipers see on the course infrared elephants hear infrasound bears smell distant carcasses sharks feel under course electric fields and pigeons navigate by magnetic fields but most of us believe that in the normal case we accurately see some reality as it is suppose i open my eyes and have a visual experience that i describe as a red tomato a meter away then i close my eyes and my experience changes to a mottled gray field if i'm sober and healthy and don't think i'm being tricked then i believe that even when my eyes are closed even while i experience a gray field nevertheless there really is a red tomato a meter away when i open my eyes and again have an experience that i describe as a red tomato a meter away i take this as evidence that the tomato was there all along to take this as evidence to gather further evidence for my belief while my eyes are closed i can reach out and feel the tomato lean over and smell it or ask a friend to look and confirm that it's still there The convergence of all this evidence convinces me that a real tomato is indeed there even when all eyes are closed and no hand touches it. But could I be wrong? This question, I admit, sounds faintly mad. Most sane persons given this evidence would surely conclude that the tomato is still there. Its existence when unseen and untouched seems to be an obvious fact, not a misguided belief. But this conclusion is a fallible belief, not a dictate of logic or an indubitable fact. We must test its validity against advances in fields such as cognitive neuroscience, evolutionary game theory, and physics. When we do so, the belief proves false. This surprising result is the subject of this book. I don't try to solve the mystery of consciousness, but I do try, in the coming chapters, to dethrone a belief that hinders a solution. In the last chapter, I suggest how we may tackle the mystery of consciousness once we have shed the burden of this false belief. What could it mean to claim that no tomato is there when I don't look? Our intuitions here can be helped by a glance back at the Necker cube. As we discussed, uh, you can see a cube with a face A in front, call it cube A, or you can see a cube with face B in front, call it cube B. Each time you view the figure, you see cube A or cube B, but never both at once. When you look away, which cube is there? Cube A or cube B? Suppose you saw cube A just before you looked away. and you answer that cube a is still there you can check your answer by looking back if you do this a few times you'll discover that sometimes you see cube b when this happens did cube a transform into cube b when you looked away or you can check your answer by asking friends to look you'll find that they often disagree some saying that they see cube a others that they see cube b they may all be telling the truth as you could check with a polygraph this suggests that neither cube a nor cube b is there when no one looks 
and that there is no objective cube that exists unobserved, no publicly available cube waiting for all to see. Instead, if you see cube A while your friend sees cube B, then in that moment you each see the cube that your visual system constructs. There are as many cubes as there are as many observers constructing cubes. And when you look away, your cube ceases to be. This example is meant only to illustrate what it may mean to say that no tomato is there when you look away. It does not, of course, prove that no tomato is there when you look away. After all, one could argue the Necker cube is illusory but the tomato is not. Making the case against unseen tomatoes is not trivial. The core point will be that the reality prompting you to create your experience of a tomato is nothing like what you see and taste. We have been misled by our perceptions. In fact, we have a long history of being misled. Many ancient cultures, including the pre-Socratic Greeks, were misled by their perceptions to believe the earth is flat. It took the genius of Pythagoras, Parmenides, Aristotle to discover, despite the testimony of the eye, that the earth is roughly a sphere. For many centuries after this discovery, most geniuses, with the exception of Aristarchus, circa 310 BC to 230 BC, were misled by their perceptions to believe that our spherical earth is the unmoving center of the universe. After all, apart from earthquakes, the earth never appears to move, and it looks as if the sun, stars and planets circle the earth. Ptolemy, circa 85 to 165, built this geocentric misreading of perception into a model of the universe that, according to the Catholic Church for 14 centuries, brandished the imprimatur of Holy Scripture. Our pension to misread our perceptions, as philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein pointed out to his fellow philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe, stems in part from an uncritical attitude toward our perceptions, toward what we mean by it looks as if, under quotes. Anscombe says of Wittgenstein that, under quotes, he once greeted me with the question, why do people say that it was natural to think that the sun went round the earth rather than the earth turned on its axis? I replied, I suppose because it looked as if the sun went round the earth. Well, he asked, what would it have looked like if it had looked as if the earth turned on its axis? The question brought it out that I had hitherto given no relevant meaning to it looks as if, on the course, in it looks as if the sun goes around the earth. Closed main quote. With Justin's point is germane, anytime we wish to claim that reality matches or mismatches our perceptions, there is, as we shall see, a way to give precise meaning to this claim using the tools of evolutionary game theory. We can prove that if our perceptions were shaped by natural selection, then they almost surely evolved to hide reality. They just report fitness. In 1543, Copernicus' book De Revolutionary Bus Orbium Colestium on the revolutions of the celestial spheres was published posthumously. In it, he proposed, as Aristarchus had before, that the Earth and other planets go around the Sun. Galileo peered through a telescope and saw evidence for this theory, moons orbiting Jupiter and Venus changing phases like our moons. The Church opposed this theory and tried Galileo in 1633 for heresy, for his temerity to claim, on the course, that one may hold and defend as probable an opinion after it has been declared and defined contrary to the Holy Scripture. Closed course. Galileo was forced to recant and sentenced to house arrest for the remainder of his life. It wasn't until 1992 that the church acknowledged its error. Several factors contributed to this error. One was belief in the idea of a great chain of being with God and the perfection of celestial spheres above and man and the imperfection of the sublunary realm below. That comported well with the Ptolemaic system. But a key factor was a simple misreading of our perceptions. The church thought we can just see that the earth never moves and is the center of the universe. As noted in the epigraph to this book, Galileo argued that we misread our perception in other ways. On the quotes, I think that tastes, odors, colors, and so on are no more than mere names so far as the object in which we look at them are concerned, and that they reside in consciousness. Hence, if the living creature were removed, all these qualities would be wiped away and annihilated. Closed quotes. We naturally think that a tomato is still there, including its taste, odor, and color, even when we don't look. Galileo disagreed. He held that the tomato is there, but not its taste, odor, and color. These are properties of perception, not of reality, as it is apart from perception. 
If consciousness disappeared, so would they. But he thought the tomato itself would still exist, including its body, shape and position. For these properties, he claimed we see reality as it is. Most of us would agree. But evolution disagrees. We will see in chapter 4 that evolution by natural selection entails a counterintuitive theorem. The probability is zero that we see reality as it is. This theorem applies not just to taste, odor, and color, but also to shape, position, mass, and velocity, even to space and time. We see none of the reality as it is. The reality that prompts you to create an experience of a tomato, the reality that exists, whether or not you see a tomato, is nothing like what you see and taste. We discarded a flat earth and a geocentric universe. We realized that we had misread our perceptions and we corrected our errors. It wasn't easy. In the process, mundane intuitions and charged doctrines were shattered. But these corrections were mere warm-ups. Now we must jettison space-time itself and everything in it. What kind of creatures are we? According to evolution, not creatures that see reality as it is. And that profoundly affects how we think about the relation between brains and consciousness. If space and time exist only in our perceptions, then how can anything within space and time, such as neurons and their activity, create our consciousness? Understanding the evolution of perception is a critical step toward understanding who we are and the provenance of our consciousness.